Okay, I'm going to talk about a Chesapeake Bay case study. I'll start by talking about some principles of Chesapeake literacy. You can go to the Ian website on April 2nd, where there's a blog and text to supporting that's uh, these, some of this literacy stuff I'm going to talk about. All right, seven principles are that Chesapeake's large, shallow, and productive, formed by a drowned river valley, the Susquehanna River. In particular, the extensive watersheds connected to the bay by a myriad of streams and rivers particularly vulnerable to runoff of nutrient sediments and toxicants. Climate change and land use alteration are major drivers of Chesapeake Bay and its watershed. It supports unique human cultures and livelihoods. In many respects, American history has been shaped by Chesapeake Bay. It's extremely well studied and intensely managed. This is a, a satellite. Uh, you can see the, the, the Drown River Valley, the deeper areas in red and uh, yellow here. Uh, coming down the main stem as well as some of the tributaries uh, feeding into it, draining a large watershed. So it's very productive, and one of the reasons it's so productive is because of the shallowness, and another reason is because it's an estuary with this two-layer flow with uh, fresh uh, water coming in, laying on top, and then the salt water uh, down below, and this allows entrainment of, of particles and nutrients and, and organisms. And, uh, and, and the sediment that comes in from the, uh, from the watershed, usually um, in pulses associated with runoff, uh, have uh, also um, bring, bring nutrients with it um, and naturally. And this ex uh, salinity gradient of the bay is very extended. It's probably the uh, most extensive, well, definitely in North America, from fresh water at the mouth of the Susquehanna to full strength seawater at the mouth over a 200 mile uh, uh, distance. And uh, just to get a, a appreciation for the, the, the depth, there are these um, uh, depth profiles for the upper, middle, and lower bay. And what you see here is the upper bay is largely, uh, you know, less than, uh, a couple meters deep. Uh, see, this is depth here, and this is the, the amount of area or volume at those depths. And you can see that uh, over 50% of the volume is less than five meters, and a considerable amount of it is is uh, less than a couple uh, a meter. Uh, in the mid bay, it's a little less so because we have the, the the deep trough here. But even in the lower bay, which is the more oceanic, that's still actually quite shallow through much of its depth. Uh, and then the myriad of, of streams and rivers uh, are, are shown on this uh, uh, map uh, that, that shows that we have the major tributaries like the James, York, Rappahannock, Potomac, Patuxent, uh, the uh, uh, Susquehanna, of course, and even our eastern shore rivers, but they're all uh, bifurcated with lots of uh, smaller streams, and so you really can't go very far in the Chesapeake watershed if you if you walk in a straight line without encountering a uh, tributary of the bay. Now the watershed covers these different uh, physiographic regions. Uh, the the big one, uh, the, the 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 one surrounding the bay immediately adjacent, is the uh, coastal plain, uh, which is you know. Uh, very uh, flat, uh, and then moving uh, up at the fall line. The fall line is where the transition of of, of from the this tidal uh, influence is 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 stopped, and that's where the uh, you know, waterfalls uh, occur, and that's of course where the big cities end up uh, occurring. And uh, upstream of that is the Piedmont. The Piedmont is the sediments eroded from the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, we have the, the Blue Ridge and then the Ridge and Valley. Blue Ridge is just really one of the Ridge and Valleys that, that begin uh, as we move up into the mountains. And then finally, the Plateau, the Appalachian Plateau itself. So the majority of the bay watershed is a very low elevation Piedmont coastal plain uh, of the adjacent to the bay, and then uh, the vast majority of the um, upper parts are Ridge and Valley and Appalachian Plateau. Uh, the watershed is uh, uh, largely 50% is Susquehanna. The next biggest is the Potomac, and then uh, after that goes to the James, and then these smaller York, uh, Rappahannock, 
uh, uh, rivers down down here, and the Choptank is the largest on the eastern shore. But these are the Choptank's very small compared to the all these western shore um, tributaries. So the vulnerability of Chesapeake is to this runoff of nutrient sediments and toxicants and recreating the fall line here, you can see the urban development that is associated with that fall line, the red being urban development. We have our tidewater development down in the Norfolk, Northport News, Hampton area. And then we have development in the Susquehanna, the lower Susquehanna River Valley here. And then um, uh, you can see uh, this development, uh, urban, but also these agricultural development. And you can see those stripes in the valleys of the Ridge and Valley and of course the entire eastern shore uh, and lots of western shore is, is uh, developed as ag as well and then forested areas up in the uh, Appalachian Plateau and uh, some of these uh, Piedmont areas as well. So one of the reasons Chesapeake is so productive and so vulnerable to nutrient uh, eutrophication is because it's naturally nutrient retentive. And that's due to a suite of different processes that all act to uh, capture uh, and retain nutrients rather than flushing through the estuary from the land source to the ocean. So there's six of these that were listed by Roman's paper. Uh, a lateral front that occurs uh, with the picnicline. The picnicline is the uh, density uh, difference between the warmer, fresher water and the cooler, salty water underneath. And it can tilt depending on the wind direction. And uh, as such, I can create a front when, when it's tilted in one direction. Uh, river plumes that come out create uh, little um, uh, uh, hot spots. Uh, and of course, all the fishermen know, know to pick on those areas where the river water meets the, uh, the salt water. Uh, there's uh, something quite unique to Chesapeake Bay is this convergence eddy, uh, which has to do with the, the, the large size and towards the south of the bay, where you get this um, small uh, eddy like you get in, out in the ocean that's set up from the Coriolis of the, the salt water coming into the bending to the right and then uh, creates this little eddy, which forms a little hot spot. Uh, hydraulic control, another unique feature of Chesapeake Bay is the water comes in uh, and, it, and it gets, uh, it's pretty shallow down here, you saw from those uh, earlier uh, graphs, and then it goes down a little bit and that creates a little dip and there's a little hydraulic uh, element that occurs there. And then two of these other features which are common to estuaries throughout the world are the estuarine turbidity maximum, where salt and fresh water mix and there's a a uh, real concentration of resuspension of, uh, of uh, particles of zooplankton and, and uh, fish larvae. Uh, it's a real hot spot. A lot of research going into that. And tidal fronts, another th thing that occurs in estuaries where you get uh, in the mouth where the, the tides are ripping through, you get these uh, small little fronts that occur. So all of those serve together to retain nutrients. And one of the consequences of this vulnerability is that Chesapeake Bay gets seasonally uh, low oxygen levels. And you can see the map of uh, dissolved oxygen in 2005 and down the main stem, you see this lack of oxygen up into the Potomac. And it's seasonal. You can see it in January in the cold water months. Uh, there's, it's well oxygenated to the bottom, but then setting up in May, June, and then peaking in July and August, we get this hypoxia until fall when the water cools down and the uh, wind stir it up and re-oxygenate re the bottom. Uh, this has been a real problem and really the genesis of the Chesapeake Bay program was this dead zone, these oxygen areas. And uh, they started being reported back in 1938 and then there's a big study in the 70s which, which, which highlighted some of these. And then as you can see, the monitoring uh, uh, that's occurred uh, uh, has shown that really starting in the 80s, it really pick, picked up. So we got these bad dead zones starting in the 80s. And then this is the, the number of scientific papers that have been published relating to this. So we're getting these swings from you know, wet year, dry year kind of swings. 
uh, and uh, uh, we're still seeing those occurring and there's a lot more interest. The scientific interest is is not the only people interested, but it, it hit the public and the public uh, cap it was, it was, imagination was captured by the term dead zone. And so this is uh, one of the diagrams they used for the Mississippi River dead zone, you know, the size of New Jersey, uh, et cetera. So this has really been, be, has become a real, uh, a real issue. And, and you can, we just did a, uh, uh, this is a, a manuscript that Jeremy Testa and a bunch of students have put together for the um, uh, hypoxia forecast of, of Chesapeake Bay. We've been done for 10 years. And you can see the dead zone gets uh, increasing uh, attention, but also this, uh, this forecast uh, is, is, is becoming part of that uh, vernacular locally. Uh, one of the problems with Chesapeake uh, is climate change, and we see this in increasing temperatures. We see it with increasing salinities and, of course, sea level rise. Uh, and if you run out these projections for different emission scenarios, Chesapeake uh, climatologically is, is starting to look more like um, South Carolina or, or even Florida in the worst case scenario over time. So, so Chesapeake is becoming uh, less temperate and more subtropical uh, with, with these changes. Uh, historically, uh, the land use uh, of the Bay pre-colonial was, was uh, very forested. And what uh, Grace Brush's uh, analysis showed with her paleoecology looking at pollen uh, in, in cores, et cetera, is that um, there are a huge number of beavers that created dams and retained the water on the, on the landscape with, with all these little beaver dam uh, uh, reservoirs that occurred behind the dams. And, and so very uh, amount of nutrient processing occurred on land and very little ended up down in the, in the bay. In early colonial days, what happened is they, first thing they did is trapped out the bee beavers. So there was a lot more water flow directly coming down. And then um, back in about 1800, they really denuded the watershed uh, and, and um, chopped down all the trees and, and had low intensity agriculture. Um, and then uh, now we've uh, urbanized and the agriculture has become intensive, but smaller footprint. So this, uh, these changes are ongoing and, and, and massive over time. And uh, one of the things fueling that is this, uh, this growth of population, and it's been a steady uh, growth and still projected to increase. So these pressures will only um, become greater. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, uh, uh, as a literacy thing, is you have to appreciate the unique human cultures and livelihoods of Chesapeake Bay. That's a skipjack, one of those oyster um, uh, boats that uh, sail powered. Uh, uh, Beautiful Swimmer is a great book about the watermen of, of Chesapeake Bay, and there's a recent redo of that um, and, and a short film uh, by Tom Horton and Dave Harp. Uh, Horton's written some beautiful books about the bay. Uh, not He lived for a year on Smith Island and talked about that, that culture, uh, that really unique uh, uh, waterman culture out there. And in many respects, American history has been shaped by Chesapeake Bay. And you can see that uh, wherever you go in the Bay, this is uh, Jamestown, John, John Smith, and, and the founding, you know, that and Plymouth Rock were the two original colonies uh, in, in the European colonies in North America. Uh, we have uh, Fort McHenry near Baltimore, where the War of 1812 was played out, and the end of the Civil War uh, with Washington and Cornwallis down in Yorktown. And then uh, if you look at this uh, map of Civil War battle sites, you can see the majority of sites are located in, the, in this Chesapeake region. So there's so many uh, throughout American history, there's so many things that are related uh, in, this, in this region. So Chesapeake Bay is extremely well studied. Historically, uh, you know, starting in 1925 when the formation of Chesapeake Biological Lab, um, this is when I call it the estuarine science found phase. This is where estuaries were, were really fully documented. Uh, most previous research had been blue water oceanography. So here we were uh, focused in on these uh, shallow water nearshore systems. 
and really define what makes an estuary. And that's the physics of you know the two-layer flow. It's the biology. It's the geology of the sediments and sedimentation and how they moved around. And it's the chemistry and biochemistry of, of estuarine waters. And then starting in the 70s, uh, this uh, funded by EPA, a big study that uh, many UMC's uh, faculty were engaged in, was this eutrophic eutrophication science to really understand the role of nitrogen and phosphorus in driving these uh, algal blooms and dead zones. And then um, starting in 1983, the formation of the Chesapeake Bay program, uh, we ended up with uh, water quality monitoring and coordinated between the states uh, and and uh, modeling, uh, you know, starting with a physical model out of Kent Island to the computer models. And now I call this an accountability phase where we um, started reconciling what what efforts we were, uh, what our investments were looking like and what was happening and basically ended in 2010 when we created the TMDL, the Total Maximum Daily Load, which is the nutrient diet that's regulatory diet that EPA is uh, placed on the bay. We'll talk about that more when we talk about science and law. And now, now into the future of looking at ecosystem response and trying to see if we can get um, a variety of, 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 of uh, things that are going to improve the bay and make it more resilient to climate change, et cetera. And it's intensively managed. Uh, so I notice I didn't say, you know, it's best studied, but, but maybe not the best managed, but it's certainly intensively managed. We have the Chesapeake Bay uh, program, which, which coordinates through EPA, but coordinates with using the states and local municipalities, and we have goal teams and science input both at the goal team level with the STAR group that I chair, and then the stack, which uh, uh, that Don and I have served on, and then uh, in, you know, input from citizen and local governments and then this management board. So it's a, it's a pretty complex and highly evolved management uh, program. But you have to ask the question, is it being well managed? And I guess uh, in 2003, there were uh, four bits of evidence that challenged the, the, the conventional wisdom that it was being managed perfectly. Well, one was a, a political scientist based at the Naval Academy, Howard Ernst, wrote a book called Chesapeake Bay Blues and talked about the happy talk that was going on and the fact that we weren't really reconciling with reality. Turning the tide, Tom Horton had written a book 10 years previously and re, uh, did a uh, a, a, a second edition talked about, you know, really focused on the population pressure and, and how to how to uh, reconcile that. And then Don uh, co-edited a book called Chesapeake Futures, which took various scenarios of development pressure as well as climate, and said, well, even if we do everything we said we're going to do, that's still not enough. And then what really pushed it over the top was the Washington Post kind of busted them for um, believing the models and not their monitoring. So that really woke up the Bay program. And, and so I think the response has been pretty good. Uh, in terms of integration, uh, we have these annual report cards that UMSIS produces, the Bay Foundation uh, throws one out there, uh, and uh, Bay Barometer tracks a bunch of the indicators through the Chesapeake Bay program. And those all come out annually. Uh, paper that I'll uh, provide for reading is a uh, 2005 summary by Kemp et al. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of science, uh, probably needs more integration uh, at that scientific level. We certainly have plenty of integration at the sort of public forum. In terms of adaptive management, this is something Don's been pushing pretty hard for a long time and he kind of blasted the Chesapeake Bay back in 2006 in a paper he wrote. He said, adaptive management is embraced as a central process in coastal Louisiana, but it's not formally been implemented in the more mature Chesapeake Bay restoration. And, uh, and so finally, and this is, you know, almost, uh, it took them almost 10 years to be responsive to this call. Uh, there is an adaptive management section on the Bay program with your classic adaptive management cycle. But more importantly, what they've done is created Chesapeake STAT, which is emulated after the Bay STAT that Governor O'Malley had uh, to track the progress. And so there's progress tracking, there's the decisions, and then the data uh, portal. So far, they've, they've, they've got live of the progress. They're still trying to finalize decisions, and then they'll start on the data. So they are making some steps in the right direction. 
it's slow. It's like you know, turning a battleship when you get this big program. Precautionary principle. Well, this is where I'd say the Bay has got mixed success on this front. Look at the forecast of urban growth for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And you can see these areas outside the, the urban centers, the existing urban centers, these peri-urban centers here are, are just growing at, at prodigious rates. And, uh, and so that's, um, that's changing our, our landscape in, in many respects, a lot more impervious surfaces. Uh, and, and so, you know, we've got to, we got to reconcile the future of the Bay with these, these growth projections. Uh, I think one of the better examples of a precautionary principle was in the crab harvest. Uh, uh, you know, the crab level, the, the crabs were um, uh, going down, 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 and they finally kind of said, oh, we better do something. So they, they set up some thresholds and targets for female crabs and basically uh, Virginia, uh, this is with O'Malley as, as, the, mayor, as the governor of, of Maryland and Tim Kaine as the governor of Virginia, uh, finally is to good crab uh, harvest levels so that the Virginia fishermen were not doing the winter dredge of the female, pregnant female crabs and leaving them to spawn rather than harvesting them. And, and you can see that, uh, you know, there was some, that and some good weather. Uh, contributed to some good years, not so good, but um, but the idea is they're finally focusing on the female uh, threshold levels and trying to reach this target to have a sustainable population. So there's some promising signs on the precautionary principle. Sustainability and resilience. Remember this uh, resilient, resilience graphic of pre-70s, Hurricane Agnes 1972, knocking it down to this current state, and then try and do restoration to get it to a, a different future state. Um, this is uh, a uh, diagram we made associated after uh, Tropical Storm Lee and Hurricane Sandy came through. And um, we, uh, we, we talked about the seasonality of the bay with its natural eco-rhythm of, of you know, things getting heated up in the summer and the spawning oysters and crabs and, the, um, and then, you know, big SAV beds and then uh, the migration internally of the female crabs and striped bass. But then Agnes came, and it came very early in the year, uh, in June, a very early storm, which really happened right, in the, right when things were going. So it was a total failure of oyster reproduction and a lot of burial of the, the oyster beds. The grass has gotten knocked up. Tropical Storm Lee and Sandy coming later in the year didn't have as much of an impact. Lee more than Sandy. Sandy was uh, really a blip for Chesapeake, devastating for New York, but not much for Chesapeake. Tropical Storm Lee was much more, and Tropical Storm Lee was about, um, was the third largest uh, flow recorded. Agnes was the first largest. So it had the potential of being devastating, but it wasn't really that bad, partly time of year. So we have to keep that in mind when we look at this, this resilience.